production at the beginning about what GRPs are. Okay. <coughs> Just for those of you who might not be familiar. <coughs> so there are several paths of gamma ray energy, which is very different from pulse profile, as you can see here. <coughs> the typical energy is in the range of a few hundred keV, and this is an important implication concerning the, the fact that these are relativistic objects. And they are uniformly distributed in the sky, which suggests that they are cosmological distance. And this is confirmed by the measure of redshift in the few of these objects where it has been possible to do so. So if you plot the duration of the gamma ray burst versus the hardness ratio defined by the two channel of the Batsy <coughs> telescope, you find that there are mainly two groups. There are short hard here and long soft gamma ray bursts. And these have different uh, properties even when you look at the environment where they tend to happen. So these are the general properties of gamma ray bursts. The ratio goes from about 100 of a second to around 100 seconds. There is a so-called compactness argument that suggests that the Lorentz factor had to be about uh, 300 of a few hundred. That's basically because you do observe non-thermal radiation at very high energy, and if you neglect the fact that if you assume they are Newtonian system, you find that the optical depth for this photon should be much larger than one, and yet you find a non-thermal distribution, which should be, are not compatible, so you have to assume a relativistic velocity. The typical isotropic energy is around 10 to the 54 Earths. This is about one solar mass of energy, essentially. <coughs> they are very variable, and the important thing to notice is that the typical time scale for the variability is much smaller than the duration of the burst, which tells you that these are not impulsive release of energy, but there is an engine which is active throughout the entire evolution of the system. Long duration gamma ray bursts, this is called long soft, are associated with the star formation region. And the interpretation is that they are they represent event in the death of a massive star. The this is called supernova long GRB connection is based on few cases where the supernova is seen in conjunction with the supernova remnant. The, the What's the energy range, let's say, for the soft and the hard? Uh, the soft tend to be, the, so the long tend to be more energetic than the short, so the short are the hardest one, tend to be. But there are questions about, because uh, gamma ray telescopes are essentially counters. So you measure, you count photons, and when you have a very hard photons, the same energy is less. So the lower number of photons, you can have a bias. In general, softer tend to go from 10 to the 50, Thermoisotropic energy from in terms of corrected energy from 10 to the 52 to 10 to the 48 something like that. Long gamma ray bursts tend to be slightly more energetic. There is no gamma ray burst to, that I know that has a well measured energy above 10 to the 53 Earths. This is in general. And when you said uh, connection with star formation, um, they, uh, the, you, you see the long one, for example, in blue in a small irregular blue galaxy and you never find them in all the elliptical. Yeah, yeah. And there are also measure of, they, you see them in, uh, when you look at galaxy, you can resolve the galaxy, you do see them upper, favorably in the location that are close to star formation mm -hmm. region. I was under the impression that the long ones are, if anything, if possibly explained by neutron star mergers, whereas the short no, ones... No, it's the other way around. So the short ones are really assumed as neutron star mergers, because there are old populations. So... Okay. In neutron star mergers, it's a good explanation for that. So then and then the the really these are formations. Yes, I don't know what's in there. So then, with this final, with, with this event, with this final stage of uh, evolution of massive stars. Yes. No all massive stars. Star. Yes. Okay. And there are other indicators that, uh, that there is an association between these. And in particular, this class of supernova, the 1BC, which are thought to be supernova originating from water a star, where there is no helium or uh, hydrogen. Okay, just to give you an idea, not all the supernova 1BC produce GRB. Even if GRB are collimated, even if you correct for collimation, the end result is that only a fraction, which is about 1% of the supernova 1BC, are associated with the GRB. And only the very the highest energy entail of the supernova distribution. Can you just say maybe, so water a stars, you say, have no... Yeah. It depends. Uh, there are the water gas star with no hydrogen envelope and water gas star with no helium envelope. So the, 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 of a so the B companion to which they lost that, or no? This is actually strong winds usually. Uh -huh. 
So the B have uh, no helium, no hydrogen line, and the C have no helium line uh -huh. in the supernova. So that's okay. the interpretation. Yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> concerning the geometry, it's the astrobic energy is very high, but it's possible to measure the total kinetic energy of the system at a later time if you can observe the radio altitude. So during the radio altitude, basically, it, you observe is a calorimeter way of measuring the entire energy of the system. And you find values which are comparable with the energy in supernova, 10 to the 51, 10 to the 52. So if you want to reconcile these two numbers, the only things that you can do is assuming that the emission was beamed toward where you may eject. So this is essentially of about 10 degrees. That's the order of magnitude that you get. And there are other evidence that suggest the existence of a jet, in particular the so-called jet break. The key idea is that you have a relativistic jet, so at the very beginning you can only see a small touch of the front of the jet because uh, emissions from other parts of the front are actually beamed away from you. <coughs> As the jet slows down, the, you can see larger and larger part of this shock because the Lorentz factor yeah. drops. At a certain point you will see the entire front of the system. So any further slowdown will not enhance the amount of emitting region that you can observe. So there will be a change in the way the luminosity varies with respect to time. And this has to be, is a geometric effect, so it has to be atomic. And there are, it's not very obvious, but there are some indication of achromatic jet breaks, which are observed in a few of these systems. And these are different frequencies, yes. And these are actually in opt or, or optical. There are, it's, it's a bit tricky because it's easy to do this in optical, but the, the, the difference in, in energy is not that large. There are, people have tried to do this in X-ray and optical, and it's more complicated because you do not observe them at the same time, X-ray fades much earlier on, mm -hmm. you can have contamination, and there are people, there are claims of observed jet breaks. But there are other systems where no jet breaks is observed, there are other systems where chromatic breaks are observed, so at different time at different yeah, would, you know, would it not make sense to shift them on top of each other, these lines? Uh, probably, but you will have to change the scale of the, yeah. the luminosity. So, here is the, the, the constant for the central energy that powers these events. So you have high energy, which means that you need a large energy reservoir, and usually that turns out to be basically accretion onto a compact object. You have a total energy which is less than the isotropic energy, which means that your outflow has to be collimated. The millisecond variability that you observe implies that the region is actually very small. Again, it's either a black or a neutron star. And you have a quasi-steady energy injection plus all of these, and it had to be relativistic, essentially. So there are two models that have been suggested for long-duration gamma bus. One is the classical collapser model. The core of the massive star collapses to a black hole. There is some angular momentum in the internal region. You form a disk, and you get something that very looks like an AGN, basically a disk with a black hole, and that, you know, produces jet by analogy. You can study this. This is called a collapse. There are problems with these models. In a few of them is that if you see a supernova, it means that somehow you have exploded your star. And the supernova that you observe associated with gamma ray bus don't look any different than regular supernova 1BC. In regular supernova 1BC, you think, well, you collapse to a neutron proton, neutron star, you launch a shock, it propagates to the star, and so on and so forth. If you were to collapse to a black hole, the mechanism to trigger a supernova would be very different, and it's very hard to explain why you have the same signature, the same observable properties at the end. The other I've been working on is the spinning neutron star. So the idea is that you can form at the very center of the collapse side, so the black hole, a millisecond magnetars. And in this case, you can tap on the rotational energy of the magnetar to power your gamma ray burst. So, <clears throat> this is the idea. Magnetic field of order 10 to the 15, 10 to the 16 Gauss with a millisecond rotation. If you look at the energy that you have available in rotational energy, this is of order 2, 10 to the 52 Earth. So immediately it tells you that you can power essentially all of the observed gamma ray bars. If you were to observe a gamma ray bars with, let's say, 10 to the 53 or 5, 10 to the 53 Earths, then that will rule out this mode. So this is a limitation that AGN and the Christian disks don't have because you can tap as much energy as you want. The typical spin down time scale you can measure using the dipole equation are of order of 100 to 1,000 seconds, and the typical E dot is of order of 10 to the 50, 10 to the 49 Earths per second, which is again comparable with what you observe. There are advantages of this system is that you know the neutron star are naturally associated with supernova. This is the canonical model for supernova. They require less angular momentum than black hole accretion disk. And the problem with black hole accretion disk is that 
you need a very lightly spinning black hole because you need essentially to power a jet on one hand, but you don't want to have too much angular momentum in the envelope because otherwise you will simply not form a disk. You will hang around centrifugal support. So there is a very small range of angular momentum that satisfies the condition to form a black hole and a disk. Plus, there is an entire class of less energetic objects called X-ray flash, which suggests that there might be a continuity between the regular supernova and gamma ray bars. So if the angular momentum is too high, really nothing will happen. Again. Well, it's, yeah, you don't form a jet. You don't form a disk, and if you don't form a disk the result is that you can't form a jet. So jet from black hole originates because there is a disk that confines them. Mm -hmm. We know that pools are produced relativistic wind. We observe them. And there are uh, indications that magnetar might have massive projects. For example, this is a magnetar observed in Western Room 1, where you observe all stars. So the estimated mass for this system, for the progenitor of this magnetar, is about 60 solar masses, which is counterintuitive because you would get about 20 solar masses if you form a black hole. That's the standard uh, book. Strong. So here is the, the way it works. You start with this idea of winds that essentially are produced by the neutron star at a very early time. So less than one second, essentially, you have the neutrino luminosity of the cooling neutron star is pretty high. The neutron star radius contrasts from about 300 kilometers to around 5, 15 kilometers. These neutrinos can heat the atmosphere of the neutron star and drive a thermal wind. As time passes, the neutron star cools down and the magnetic field becomes progressively more important in the dynamics of the winds because the mass loss rate in the wind drops. And you will become first a magnetically dominated wind, and then as time passes, it will become a relativistic wind. And finally, you will have to go to what's called a pulsar regime, essentially a force-free winds, where you might have only leptons in tire winds, or you might have just magnetic waves. That's magnetic waves. When you say force-free, you mean... Uh, non baryonic beaming. You, uh, yes, you means that you can neglect pressure and inertia of the matter. Mm -hmm. So the, the end result is that for regular pulsar, regular photon neutron star wind, for pulsar-like parameters are not dynamically relevant for the supernova. Uh, uh, the start of a T between two and five seconds, you say that it's, it's very weak relativistic. Oh. Yes, around two seconds is very weak. And relative. then it, when at longer times, it becomes much more relativistic. Yes. That is more well, it's, it's, it's more relativistic, but the point is that this is a magnetic dominated system. Oh, okay. so, so, you get, so it's relativistic in the sense that you get a jet which is mostly pointing flux dominated. And so the mass is lower, but it's accelerated to higher speed, but m dot is smaller. E dot is actually, e dot is, it drops because the star is spinning down. But, but that's because they're getting closer to the, to the I mean, deep end to the, in the, in the potential. And that's why you can uh, tap more energy. No, because you are. What do you mean, tap? I mean, as. Uh, You're tapping out. I was surprised that uh, it becomes more realistic yeah. at later times. Yes. And I thought the, the reason for that is that you are simply uh, contracting. N no, because b. So the relativistic is uh, is, BN, is basically b squared over rho, which is the offense speed. So as rho drops, because you are cool, your neutron star is cooling down, so it doesn't produce. your Mass loading of the wind drops, yeah, or yeah, atmosphere yeah. become uh, uh, steeper and steeper. Yeah, you get uh, uh, yes. an alpha speed which reaches the speed of light, and at that point behaves like a relativistic regime. So the magnetic. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. What is, I'm sorry, what I thought? The wind I thought? E dot, yes, the, mm -hmm. it's uh, the, the energy tapped into the wind. Ah. Mm -hmm. So. Okay, so this is a diagram to illustrate essentially the, the, the structure of the wings. So here you have the period of the neutron star and the luminosity. As time passes, the luminosity, the neutron luminosity drops, and the period increases because of loss rate, of energy loss. And so this is the basically able to describe the evolution of your proton neutron star from an enhanced mass loss phase up to a relativistic phase at a later time. You can also build up simple cur curves for the evolution of the luminosity and of sigma, this is a relativistic pattern. So this is what happened to the E dot, the energy, the luminosity in the wind, and it goes down with time, as you can see, because the pulsar is spinning down. As a, as a fact that the, the neutral luminosity is actually dropping, the wind becomes more and more magnetized, with this parameter, the sigma, the light cylinder, which represents the magnetization of the wind, essentially how relativistic it is. And one is essentially more than actually relativistic. And you can see it rise quite rapidly. The point is that if you want to have a gamma reverse, you want to have energy and relativistic output. So 
So you can't go too early because you might have lots of energy, but this is not relativistic. Neither wait too late because, yes, you have it relativistic, but you don't have enough energy to power it. And that means that in the millisecond magnetar model, there is a, a typical range between 10 and 20 seconds, which are the characteristic times at which you can trigger a gamma box. A, a note of caution is that this depends on the cooling curve that you assume for your neutron star, which might be well or known or not, depending on what you think. So in general, what you find is that high magnetic fields tend to be favored, because with high magnetic field, you reach high values of magnetization at early time when you still have enough energy in your system. Favored to explain the for gamma ray bus, yes. If you have weak, fields that are too weak, Basically, you get a relativistic regime too late, and the star has already spinned down too much. So here is how the winds work. So the, the, the conditions are reasonable, but we have to look at, can you form a jet out of this? So if you look at what happened to the wind, this is a simulation that shows the energy flux. At the, at, the, at the beginning, is all along the axis. But then as you go on, as the wind becomes progressively more and more relativistic, the energy flux becomes essentially equatorial. The field was circular? The, the field, field, the field is, a mon is, a, is a split monopole for yeah. the simple reason that essentially the light, this is 200, mm -hmm. and the light cylinder is at 5. So it makes absolutely no difference what you assume. The important thing is the amount of open flux. Mm -hmm. And we're just surprised that initially you had very strong collimation. Um, normally you need good, I mean you have good collimation if you have an imposed vertical field. Then you so in it. this case, it's, you have decent collimation because the, the, the flow is uh, non relativistic so you have uh, Essentially, you have a J cross P exit point over the axis, and that collimates, self collimates the wind. Mm -hmm. As you go to later times, you become relativistic. In your equation, there is also a rho E. There is an long term in the Lorentz force that you cannot neglect anymore. And the electric field is compatible to the magnetic field when the V is of order of C. And if you do the math, the two cancel out each other. So essentially, the wind that collimates. Mm -hmm. And you can also look this at the magnetic field lines. So these are magnetic field lines that are kind of parabolic at the very beginning, and then they slowly get progressively more radial. Mm -hmm. And you can show that when sigma exceed around 200, around 100, they basically look like a split monopole over a range of radii which is compatible with the star that you are looking at. So color coded in both plots? Okay, this is the energy flux. This is a high on the equator mm -hmm. and lower at the pole. Mm -hmm. Here is B5. So uh -huh. and you can see that the field is uh, ra the polar field is radial and B5 goes like uh, yeah. the cylindrical radius, which is what you would expect for a force free solution. Mm -hmm. And you can also look at the Lorentz factor, and the Lorentz factor tends to be higher at intermediate latitude. It's not higher on the equator as you would expect, because there is a combination of acceleration properties which depends on the structure of the field line and mass loss. But in general, it's kind of quite uniform. The, the change in Lorentz factor here is around 9, and here is around 10. Is one of these lines an organic, the Alvin surface? No, these are uh, iso-velocity surfaces, essentially. Iso-Lorentz uh, factor surface. Okay, but the Alvin surface? The uh, Alvin surface. Oh, the Alvin surface is a light cylinder. Ah, always. And yes, yes. And, the, and which is down here. And the fast magnetosonic surface is sigma to the one third of the light cylinder. So sigma is about 60 to the one third is. Around five. And you actually don't resolve any disk, of course. And no, there is no disk in this case. There's actually the neutron star. So this is a this is a for an isolated system. So I, I resolve both the slow because there is a slow surface, the authentic and the fast. They are not just you don't can't see them here. But then what is the boundary condition on the equator? The boundary condition on the equator is a symmetry on the axis. And in principle, you you might have a reconnection that goes on. You have a white point, so you can have solar helmet streamer like reconnection and we do observe that. Mm -hmm. So you can form plasmoids. But the point is that condition in the wind suggests that there shouldn't be much resistivity. So the cold resistivity is way above what is the physical resistivity. Mm -hmm. So I basically I suppress any kind of reconnection on the axis. Mm -hmm. so what equation do you solve here? What is the matter of This is the we have a conservation of particle number, <coughs> total momentum, total energy. Mm -hmm. Plus an equation of state, in this case, the gas with four thirds, because uh, you can show that in these systems, there's radiation dominated systems, and the pressure behaves like density to the four thirds. So, what we find is that you can have a jet with high energy, but only at the, uh, when the wind is not relativistic. 
When the wind is relativistic, you actually don't get a jet. You get a force-free wind, which is most of the energy is going into the equator. So the question is that if you take an isolated magnetar, that's not what you would like to get the gamma reverse, because you can't get simultaneously these two regime. And <coughs> the question is, what is the role of the confined projectors? Because your magnetar is not exploding in a vacuum. There is probably 10 solar mass of compact star hanging around. So the, the equivalent, the large scale equivalent of what we are looking at are pulsar wind nebulae. So pulsar wind nebulae, you have a pulsar here, is producing a relativistic wind. And this relativistic wind is confined by the more massive supernova remnant that hangs around. Now, if you take this and it's instead of... confinement that means pressure confinement. No, it's actually, it's not pressure confinement. It's, the, it's expanding inside very cold supernova remnant. So the mass in the supernova remnants is much higher. So this nebula is expanding. It's not... Oh, yeah. But the expansion speed is very small. It's about 1,000 kilometers okay, per so second. Okay, so completely uncollimated. Cool. And there is some hint of collimation. Uh -huh. I can show you. So in this case, what you have is that if you take these systems, and instead of a pulsar, you take a magnetar. So you rise your E dot by about 10 orders of magnitude. Instead of a supernova remnant, you take the interior of a star. So you rise your density by about a lot. And all of this, instead of being about 10 light here, is of order of 10 to the 9 centimeters, you get something that resembles very closely the condition inside your exploding star. And if you trust MHD, MHD is scale-free, so the problem should be the same. So what do we know about this object is that even if most of the energy is actually injected along the equator, this is the equator of the pulsar rotation, the system is actually elongated along the axis. And this is because there is a strong toroidal field in the system, so the pressure in the bubble is in either static equilibrium is much higher on the axis than on the equator, despite much of the energy being injected on the equator. So this can drive moderately elongated system. And the idea is that, well, maybe if the magnetic field is stronger, if the magnetization in the bubble is stronger, you can actually drive a jet out of this. Things expand quite slowly, but the idea is better than that. So, this is the toy model that I have been working on. You take your favorite stellar model. You assume that there have been a successful supernova. A successful supernova has been triggered inside. So now you have, there is a shock which is propagating inside your star. And there is a cavity, an, almost an empty cavity, which is left inside. It's not really empty, but for what concerns that. And there is a compact remnant. And this remnant is producing a wind. It's your proton neutron star neutrino driven wind. And it's rotating. As a result, these winds move at a speed which is much larger than the expansion speed of the shock. And it, it will get stopped, it will form a reverse shock, or a termination shock, if you want to call it, and you will create a subsonic bubble, essentially. This is not any different than any regular stellar wind bubble. The point is that now you have a magnetic field. So you have a very fast rotator. The magnetic field here will be mostly toroidal magnetic field, will be compressed. And the end result will be there will be a higher pressure on the axis. If this pressure is high enough, it will drive you a jet. And what it has to do, it doesn't have to be, it just has to do some kind of indentation into the star. There is a pressure, there is density profile in the star that go down like r to the minus 2, r to the minus 3. So as long as this starts carving a, a hole inside the star, it will favor the propagation of the system. So <clears throat> here is a simulation. These are radii of the neutron star. So this is the neutron star at the center. There is a wind. There is a termination shock where the wind is slowed down. And there is, this is the, the wind nebula that's formed inside. There is a supernova shock that's propagating inside the star. And the radius of the star is around half. So the star is standard distance. Is it still in the proximity of the problem? Yes, this is actually similar. And what we find is that there is a higher pressure on the axis of the system, as you would expect in the toroidal magnetic field. And already after one second, this has been enough to actually start driving a jet inside the projector and overcome the supernova. Right? So when you pointed out the radius of the star, that corresponds to maybe uh, a solar radii or something? No, that corresponds to less. a few ten to the ten centimeters. Because this oh. is the this is the water for your start. So it's basically the very ten to the ten. Yes, few ten to the ten. So that means ten is solar radius. Because one solar radius is seven times ten to the ten. Uh -huh. 
Yeah. So a bit less. Yeah. It's a bit less than this. It's about two ten to the ten centimeters. Oh, two. Okay. Yes. A few ten yeah. to the ten. Yes. So it's basically it's the core of the of the star without the action. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, and these are movies that show the late time evolution. This is the radius of the star. The the jet propagates out, and once it emerges out of the star, it can accelerate. So here is <coughs> one. This is the speed. You can see that the core of the jet slowly reached the speed of light. So this is the velocity field? This is the velocity field, and this is density. Okay. So the density it tells you that there is a low density jet that propagates, essentially, mm -hmm. and it's carving its way through the star. There is the supernova shock, which is propagating inside the star still, and there is a cocoon that forms slowly engulfing the star. And here is the velocity, and this is essentially C1, the speed of light. And you have a central jet with a high speed. You have some form of low velocity cocoon with about an opening angle around five degrees. Rho v approximately constant. Rho multiplied by velocity. Times radius squared, right? No, what do you mean constant? No, the, the, the same order. You know this configuration. No, you argue that you first uh, flow have, uh, has has very uh, weak density. Yes. So it, what, it means that energy is the same or moment is the same motion. What, what do you mean? Momentum. Oh, momentum? No, the momentum is quite high actually here. The same or in, in different places? So, no. yes. so, so you're asking along the jet what happens? Yeah. Yeah. So the along the jet there is variability. Uh -huh. There is temporal variability. And there is variability because there is the dynamics happening down here. Uh -huh. so it's not stationary. It's not stationary. There is, there is there is lots of uh, circulation happening inside the center, and I will show you in a minute. What's it. So this is the structure inside, essentially. So you have your neutron star sits here. You have the wind of the neutron star that occupies this region, and this here, this kind of strange shape, is the termination shock. And the termination shock is not a sphere, for a simple reason that most of the energy is actually injected on the equator, not on the pole, so the run pressure of the wind is not uniform. Plus, the bubble is magnetized, so the pressure on the axis is much larger than here, which means that that also contributes to giving you an oblate shock. As a result of your oblate shock, what happens is that the, the, when the relativistic wind interacts with the shock at high latitude, this is an oblique shock, so there is the velocity post shock is still supersonic, it's a fraction of the speed of light of order of 0.5 c. So you have large circulation and stress of the magnetic field, and essentially you form a jet after. And this is, these pictures, you might not believe it, but there are systems that show something like this. So this is a pulsar wind nebula, similar to the craft. You have a pulsar down here, the pulsar is inclined. You see this arc here, this arc here is the equatorial region, and you can only see the upper one, you don't see it back, because it's Doppler boosted. And if you measure the Doppler boosting based on the difference in luminosity, you find speed of order of 0.5 c which suggests that the shock cannot be a strong shock everywhere, otherwise you will basically get much smaller speed. And you see there is a jet that points down in this direction, and there is also a counter jet here, which is much, much more weaker. And the speed of this jet, you can measure that too, through local boosting, and you find the speed of order 0.6, 0.7c. So these systems can indeed produce supersonic jet inside. This is a confined bubble. Now, the overall bubble is not very elongated, because the power that goes into the jet is very small. This is a pulsar. If you were to take a magnetar and put the same power, the jet will have enough power to actually punch a hole through and go all the way. And to conclude, these are the properties in the jet. So, forget about this case. Case B is the one which has the highest magnetization. And as you can see, this is the Lorentz factor as a function of radii. So basically, the jet emerged from the star around here and is slowly accelerating. But there is variability, and there is variability because there is dynamics in the inner regions and the mass loading is not uniform. There are, along the axis, you can have occlusion and other things. You can look at the energy loss rate, and what you find is that all these uh, dash, da, do, da, mm, dashed and dotted lines represent essentially energy flow in the jet. You can define the jet as the either the high relativistic core or including some of the cocoon. The solid line is the spin down power of the central magnet. So what you are comparing here is the energy that flows into the jet once the jet is out of the star with the energy that is instantaneously injected by the magnetar down in the core. And they essentially are the same, which means that the vast majority of the magnetar energy 
is actually tapped into the jet. None of that energy, essentially, or a negligible amount of that energy, goes into power in the supernova. And that's consistent with observation that tells you that the supernova is no different if it has a GRB engine than if it doesn't. Which means that the GRB engine cannot affect too much the supernova properties, otherwise you will see some difference. You can also look at the feedback of your star onto the central supernova. So the solid line are the solution for a spinning down protomagnetar, the, the, the dashed lines, in the case of no confinement. And the solid line is the same result once you put it inside a star. And the only things that you can see is actually in the angular momentum loss rate, there is this slightly bump here at around two seconds. These happen because at later time, Essentially, the systems, the, the, the internal cavity, the wings cease to exist, and the internal cavity becomes sub-fast magnetosome. At that point, in principle, the environment could exert a torque onto the central star. But the result is that this torque is essentially negligible. And the reason is that the torque on the central star is mostly governed by the property at the alphenic surface, not at the fast magnetosonic surface. The alphenic surface is the light cylinder. And in order for material from the star to move down to the light cylinder and change the structure of the alphenic surface, you need a very, very strong pullback because it's very powerful down there. And essentially, in none of the cases we have looked, there has been enough pullbacks to actually see any sensible change in the angular momentum loss rate. At most, this is going to change the angular momentum loss rate if the magnetic field is quite weak by something about 20 to 30%. And that's basically when you can't measure it. Oh, okay. So these are the conclusion. And I'll let you go to the next talk. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions, please? This is very so, uh, no, so the, it's very coordinated in these pictures, well, in, in any picture, like this jet, do not self coordinate mm -hmm. There is no way of self coordinating a jet. So if you start with a relativistic system that is not coordinated at the base, you, you're not going to do that. In, in order to coordinate it, you need confinement. So in a Christian disk, for example, the confinement is usually supplied by the body that has a thick disk. The thick disk is very massive, and your jet basically is forced by the disk itself to bend up. In this case, you have no disk, essentially, because you have your isolated neutral status for most. So the collimation is supplied by actually the environment, the large-scale environment. And it's that environment that somehow, out of the wind, make it subsonic, allow the wind to collimate, and then once it collimates, it's like punching a hole in a balloon filled with hot air, the air will exit out of that balloon at a very high speed. And this is not what you would call pressure confinement. It was something just a well, pressure confinement. this is not really pressure confinement. So it works even if the, the well, it depends how you look at it. It works even if the environment has zero pressure. And mm -hmm. the, the idea is this, that uh, you, essentially what really matters is the ratio of the expansion speed of the bubble over the sound speed of the system. So if this ratio is very small, essentially the bubble is confined because the dynamics of the bubble will happen on a time scale much faster than what, how the bubble expands. Now the bubble expands because you have the pressure inside pushing against a very dense medium. And so the expansion speed is not relativistic. It proceeds at uh, typical speed of supernova remnant, maybe 30,000 km per second, something like that. The dynamics inside is happening at the sound speed, at the speed of light, so 10 times faster. So for what? For, the, for internal dynamics, it looks like it's perfectly confined, but, but the bubble is actually expanding. Mm -hmm. What are the physical reasons for formation of jets, but not the formation of another kind of motions, another form of yeah. integration? So what is the reason why you do jets? So the reason for, for jet in this case is that you have mostly a toroidal magnetic field in your system. Mm -hmm. Yes. And the pressure that you exert in that system, if, it's a, if you take a metallurgical magnetic field in equilibrium, in hydrostatic equilibrium, the pressure on the axis is much higher than every, everywhere else. Which means that the systems will actually 
push on axis much more than what it pushed everywhere else around the confined environment. It's kind of uh, opposite. It should be minimal pressure. And again, if it's true, it's not too much. No, why is minimal pressure? If you put maximum pressure on X, yes. you, should push, you should throw X or the... No, because it's a magnetic field, it's a tension. So the magnetic field in equilibrium V goes like, if you have a curve, yes. V goes like 1 over R. V squared goes like 1 over R squared. So where is V squared high? Close to the, close to your axis, to your Y. Right. And it doesn't push sideways because there is magnetic tension that prevents the, the, that. So you can only push up and down. So plasma beta here is small. Yeah? Plasma beta here is very small, yes. Right. So P is... Uh, a small fraction of the Not only this, but also the, the sigma, so the ratio of magnetic energy over everything else, rest mass energy and uh, pressure energy and kinetic energy, is of order of a few of these. So it's much higher. The magnetic minimum is broken. Yes. What the energetic regime in the jet? Is that sort of almost roughly the same distance? from the center of the star, let's say, over time. So the relativistic regime of the jet, depending, this is, it depends a lot on the kind of engine that you're assuming. So if, you, if it is a black hole, for example, the jet is essentially polar and relativistic because you don't have a surface, so you cannot mass load the jet from the base. You can contaminate through per creation, for example, within the, the, the jet region itself. But that gives you a very low mass loading on the jet itself. So the jet is relativistic from down, essentially from the black hole surface. In a magnetar, no. The jet becomes relativistic as it expands out. So the wind reaches a relativistic speed at, around, at, the, at the location of the alpenic surface, essentially. The alpenic surface is the light cylinder. So when you reach the light cylinder, the speed is of order of the speed of light. That is relativistic regime stuff. The point is that in order to get your Lorentz factor from the of order 2 to be of order 200, that takes a much longer radius. And in general, that depends on the efficiency of the magnetic to kinetic energy conversion. If you take ideal MHD and you have no confinement, that's very ineffective. So you can, you can show that in ideal MHD, you can only convert Basically, the, if you start with a wind that has a ratio of magnetic to kinetic energy 1,000, then your asymptotic Lorentz factor is over 10. And you will remain a magnetized wind. If you start with 10 to the 6, your asymptotic Lorentz factor will be 100. So it's a magnetization to the 1 third is the maximum Lorentz factor. So you need some form of collimation to actually power up to Or dissipation. Okay. If you... It changed now the angular velocity. If you did a parameter study, yes. different angular velocities. Is it then correct that for smaller angular velocities, you would uh, rather come to supernova scenarios, or so for a small? My understanding is that uh, so we did only for a limited range of velocity. So in general, what you find is that if it is uh, a 10 millisecond rotator, for example then you might have uh, you might have a supernova with some modification. For example, you might have an elongated supernova, asymmetric supernova, mm -hmm. or you might get an X-ray flash. So X-ray flash are essentially the same as gamma reverse, but they pick a much lower energy. So that's another possibility, that you might still be able to punch a jet to the start. But there is a problem that you is it to punch a jet through the star that overtakes a supernova explosion itself, you need to have at least, I would say, 10 to the 49 Hertz of energy available. Now, the energy scale like omega squared. So if you go from 1 millisecond to 10 millisecond, then your energy goes from 10 to the 52 to 10 to the 50. So you are already reaching the threshold at which you are not going to be able to drive a very powerful event. The question is that there is a, there is a range of energy in, in gamma ray bars. So maybe the, very, the more energetic one will not fit very well with these features, but there, are, there is an entire class of less energetic, more energetic event 
and which could be free. <coughs> it's not clear if there is a continuous transition from supernova to GRP. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But I would say that, uh, yes, 10 milliseconds, well, for uh, 10 milliseconds, depending also on the magnetic field. Mm -hmm. So for, uh, I would say, yes, 10 to the 49 erg is about the threshold to, to actually drive something that you can, you could, we would classify as a GRP jet. That means either 10 to the 16 gas magnetic field with a 10 millisecond rotator, or even a faster rotator, but with a much weaker magnetic field. So you need to have both of these, with fast rotation and high Would you consider the magnetic field as a separate independent parameter that you may want to tune? No, so the... the no, the, the, the real parameters that describes the progress of this system is this uh, sigma parameter, which is basically the product of omega square, phi, phi square, magnetic plus, divided m dot. And you can show that uh, you can basically normalize, you can basically dimensionalize all the equation of your winds with that parameter. Mm -hmm. So if I do two simulation with the same amount of sigma and I look at the condition outside the light cylinder at large distances, mm -hmm. there is no difference. Mm -hmm. All right, any other questions? Yes, uh, I think I did not get the geometry of the problem right. So what is the direction of the jet related to the toroidal and their perpendicular? So the, the, you have a system that rotates. Yeah. So there's a toroidal magnet. Oh. Okay. So you have your, your star is here, rotates. Mm -hmm. So basically there is a wound up magnetic field that works this way. And you have a confinement of that. Uh -huh. And the jet is in which direction? The jet is in this direction. So, uh, that means the flux, magnetic flux is not frozen in the... Uh, yeah, it is completely frozen. Uh, but then uh, the flow is perpendicular to the magnetic field, right? So can the flow be along the magnetic field? Oh, no, there is also a... Uh, there is also... Well, mm -hmm. there is a velocity along the field line also, of, because that you can't neutralize. Oh, so it's like that. So, yes, the magnetic... Basically, you have... The system is these uh, this fields here at the base of the star. There is a confinement, and then there is a field that essentially does this. Oh. It goes up along the jet, and it actually had to close. So we will do something like this, and go down. Well, you know, movement of element of liquid is real spiral. No, actually, real movement is not spiral. It is. It's basically straight. And the reason why it's basically straight is that it's if you take just the radial properties. This is one, this is 10 kilometer, and this is 10 to the 9. Mm -hmm. So essentially the ratio of a VR over V phi, V phi over VR goes like 1 over R. And the net result is that if they are, they are compatible in the closed magnetosphere around the light cylinder, by the time they reach the interaction region, one of them will be a thousand times less than the other. So to zero, it, the code treats all the components, but to zero order the that component basically is not there. And what happens in a, a, a nearby light cylinder, there will be some interesting things happening in Well, no, not really. It doesn't happen anything. Contrary to any expectation, it's very smooth flow, as it should be. So, especially if you look from above, this is the axis, mm -hmm. there is the light cylinder here, mm -hmm. and your magnetic field lines behave like this. Mm 